Welcome to Releasing Whiteness with your co-hosts, Damali Robertson, Annie Stafford, and Christine Shermer. Releasing Whiteness is a YouTube series and podcast created to explore the many ways whiteness shows up in our society and the many ways we're being called to release it. And by release it, we mean dismantle, watch it die. We mean it's way past time to give birth to something else, to our interbeingness, our shared humanity. Each of our conversations offers truth as a medicine. Each of our conversations offers mutuality as a salve. In the spirit of Sao Bona, we're always asking, who do I have to be for you to be free? And who do you have to be for me to be free? Welcome to Releasing Whiteness. Remember to subscribe, like, and share. Thank you. What's happening, white people? <laughs> if anybody was alive in 2020, I was. You were. Yeah, we were here. We were here. And in 2020, <laughs> a couple things happened. Breonna Taylor. I, I like to talk about Breonna Taylor because she was actually murdered before George, George Floyd. Mm-hmm. And um, her mother and activists and her uh, partner uh, all have raised her, um, kind of what happened to her, up. But Breonna Taylor was murdered, and then George Floyd was murdered in 2020. And we had such an uprising. We're going through COVID, so much was going on. But there was such a response. And then you saw all these corporate entities. Everybody had a statement. Mm -hmm. Everyone was investing in DEIB. I saw all these images talking about racism being a public health issue. Mm -hmm. And here we are. What what year is this? Twenty twenty four. Four years yeah. later, and we're acting like that never happened as mm-hmm. a society. We got companies backpedaling, DEIB people being fired, uh, critical race theory under attack. Um, there's the all the Moms for Liberty groups banning books. Hmm. There's this whole backsliding, and so I wanted to hear from you all. What you thought, uh, where, A, have you also observed, I mean, we're here on the planet together, but have you observed what I observed? And what do you think is the difference between then and now for white folks? Speak for all white folks, by the way. Yeah. I'm going to just say, y'all too? On behalf of all white people. On, on behalf of every white person. And, anyway, but y'all are not doing that. Y'all are speaking for yourselves. Yes. But what do you think yeah. is the difference? And whoever wants to start. You know, I don't know if it's because people were at home and just Mm -hmm. had more time on their hands than we do now, Um, or, you know, it's it's hard to know what really galvanized people, I mean, besides the atrocities that we were witnessing, like, what galvanized so many people in 2020 and really created that, like, swell, swell of change that you talk about? I mean, there were jobs being created left and right, all, like you said, the corporations with all those campaigns, and it, it really, like, I was feeling, I'm kind of cynical sometimes, I hate to say, but sometimes in these moments I get feel cynical because there's all this um, attention paid to, you know, some harm that was done or some horrible murder that happened, um, and then it very quickly fades away and life goes back to quote-unquote normal status quo. So I was feeling cynical in the beginning, and then it just kept going, mm-hmm. and I thought, oh my gosh, this is it, what a moment, this is amazing. Um, and so what's different now, I don't, I, I don't know. It's like the tail was longer, like the attention span lasted longer, but in a way, instead of just fading away, it feels now like there's actually a real active reversal, yeah. to your point that people are being fired i feel like people are being scapegoated deib people are being scapegoated um and fired you know when their institution feels uncomfortable doesn't want to have a particular conversation um yeah all the book but yeah i mean i'm just repeating everything you said but i feel like we're having this sort of like backlash basically like a little like half inch of progress was made in awareness and in like attention and sort of like many voices coming out to say, like, this is wrong and racism actually really needs to end. Um, 
and then now it's it's not just like it went away. It's like follow up question though for you. Where does the backlash come from? What do you think mm. as far as like in relationship to the construct we think of as whiteness? Where does that backlash come from? Do you think? I mean, this is. I mean, it's, it has to be white folks. The confusion for me is that there were so many people, white people, white-bodied people in the streets during that time, fighting, making statements, public, you know, like really stepping up and standing up. And I don't believe that those people have all changed their minds. It's just that, that maybe they've become quiet and people who are sort of actively uh, happily identify as racist are louder. But I might, you know, that's a guess. I don't know. Mm. I don't know what you think, Amy. What do you think, Amy? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was thinking about that. Um, I think that there has been quite an organized response um, and attack on, on anti-racist work. And I think that attack takes different shapes in different moments, but... Um, the you know the ousting of people in in um, DEIB positions, um, the the attack on and ousting of um, you know I particularly notice it in black women in in positions of power. You know the um, president of Harvard that was that was ousted oh, comes mm-hmm. to mind, right? And so Claudine Gay, Claudine Gay, exactly, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. so. There is a very systematic, I think, attack against people doing visible work um, um, and embodying, um, embodying, um, you know, anti-racist power and 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 power. I when I say power, I mean empowerment. You know, um, not power over, but power with. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that. There are political forces in this country that have been amplifying racism, just as you you both alluded to. And I also think that we, the work is to constantly, I think for white body people in particular, the work in this culture and in this country and in society is to constantly work to embrace being uncomfortable. I think we have a societal inclination to slip back into comfort. And if you're white in a white supremacist society, it is comfortable already that the society is designed to keep you comfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that there is... So... so, Can you just pause? That's profound. I think that's one of those moments I just want to breathe that in. Just like take it... Society, the whole thing is constructed to keep you comfortable, comfortable. and folks. complacent. White folks, white bodied people. Yeah. yeah, it's structured for you. Mm-hmm. Mm. And 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 so when other things, yeah, thank you, because like that, that's it. Feels like that's really at the crux of it. And when other things um, come up that take our attention away, perhaps it's work, family, um, any number of things. Um, if we're white-bodied in a white supremacist society, there isn't a way. There really isn't. But it, there's an illusion that we, somehow the work can be paused, which is not true if you are in a black or brown body. Hmm. Right? <laughs> that the that option. reality, that option, option. does yeah. not exist. Yeah. And so... I think that's a really, uh, that's just, that's the thing, you know? And so as white-bodied people, we have to, we get to develop our muscles mm-hmm. of, of staying with the discomfort, mm-hmm. of, of co- staying committed to making a world that is truly comfortable or truly safe, yeah. will go as safe and care-centered for everybody, um, Mm. This makes me think of a question that's not, it's a little off script, but, you know, I work in DEIB, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. 
I work for a pretty significant organization, lots of staff, lots of perspectives. And I was in a meeting recently where I'm a black bodied person. Um, there's a white bodied person and another uh, body of culture, as Resma Menachem calls them, which is people of color. Mm -hmm. um, and so very often we have bodies of culture that really feel more comfortable with their white adjacency. They feel more comfortable with the whiteness, the concepts of whiteness. And this particular person, that's my interpretation, is that they're more comfortable with this, uh, you know, with, you know, that piece in the workplace. You know, like when I come into a room, I'm interrupting that. And that makes people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So in this exchange, and there happened to be another black body person in this meeting. So we're in the meeting, we're in this exchange where I'm pointing out something about something to do with what I feel is the status quo. And I'm giving that person some perspective. And they got so angry in that meeting. Mm -hmm. And they actually started to cut me off, raise their voice. They got really like, and I basically stood my ground and said, you're not going to speak to me that way. And, you know, I'm not having it. And it turned into this thing where he just kept pushing mm -hmm. angrily. And the other white body person who was in there is actually his supervisor. So it's an interesting dynamic. Mm. So he's there, she's here, I'm here, another black body person. And what was interesting to me is like, I would not, you know, I decided I wasn't backing down. So it ended when the person's supervisor kind of like jumped in and was like, hold on, what's going on? But when I had a conversation with her afterward, she said she had never seen anything like that. And she's a white body person. Hmm. She's like, I've never seen that. I didn't even know. And I love her, right? So, But I mean it like she was just so aghast. Hmm. And I was like, well, that's so interesting because I've seen this time right. and time again. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I've seen especially black workers targeted, mistreated, and disrespected and she had never seen See, that yeah. and we're probably close in age mm -hmm. I think I'm a little older than her but we're not that far apart and I thought that is so interesting to me mm -hmm. that she could say she'd never seen something like that and what was also interesting is the other black body person and I like checked in afterwards not only had we seen that been there done that yeah. The reason we don't meet with people, like the reason that we meet together with people is when moments like that happen, mm. we have witnesses. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And people don't think that. But we have that conversation because every meeting I've had with that person that I'm telling you mm. that got very uh, disrespectful, I'd met with this other colleague of mine because I can feel mm -hmm. when people feel you're trying to stir something up. Mm -hmm. So you know the plan is to come for you. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's an interesting mm -hmm. thing to live in a black body in mm -hmm. a society that values their comfort and not the abuse and the violence that the black body and the bodies of culture. Right. So that's my long story, but like, what do y'all think about a situation like that? I saw you had yeah. yeah. and speak <laughs> up because I think our Isn't mics are catching? trying to yeah be sure we get everybody. Well, the first thing that struck me is when you talked about the white bodied person in the room who said she had never seen that before. Mm -hmm. And what occurred to me was that she has probably seen it, assuming she has worked not in one hundred percent white organizations her whole career, she has seen it not only at work, but probably out in the world as well, but hasn't registered it. Yeah. Versus people who move through the world in bodies of color, who are gonna see, you know, you, you have to be, like you have to be paying attention for your own safety. Um, so it kind of gets back to that choice that we have as white people mm -hmm. to be comfortable, to not notice, to not pay attention, to not speak up. It doesn't affect me, right? Even though it does. Right. Um, and I'm just thinking about how, what, like, what a baby step it would be if, um, if we could just really get white people to embrace that, like, paying attention, just mm -hmm. watching, like, mm -hmm. being in a room and just noticing, 
Um, I'm, yeah, anyway, so being in a room and just noticing what's happening for the people in the room who are not from the majority, identity majority mm-hmm. in that room, you know, well, white body, I mean, mm. yeah. yeah. You touched on discomfort, though, which, what is it about white discomfort? We're so, uh, there's so many times when I hear white folks, white-bodied people, especially in work context, talk about not wanting people to be uncomfortable. <laughs> and like, for example, the conversation about what's happening in, around the world, Palestine and different places, they don't want to touch it because it'll make some right. groups uncomfortable. Right. right. And I think to myself, well, I'm uncomfortable every day. Right. right. Like, I walk into rooms where y'all are talking about things that feel very uncomfortable to me. And yet I'm here. Right. And I look at the discomfort and I ask myself, why am I uncomfortable? But what is it, do you think, that white discomfort is like an untouchable thing? It's like, can't go there, can't make white people, white body people uncomfortable. What is that? Genuinely, I'd like to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a great question. I think the socialization, this is something I feel like I'm like just trying to get my mind around and so I don't feel like I have it super well thought out or articulated even to myself, but I feel like the structures that uphold white supremacy, like the, the, the way that a society has to operate has to... Um, socialize us to value certain people above it's 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 an intrinsically hierarchical situation right and the people at the top of that hierarchy um white-bodied male um cisgendered you know, and, and, and wealthy or land owning, you know, um, um, at the very top of that, we are, I think all, many of us socialized to make sure that that comfort is at the top of the, the priority, um, list. And then it, and then it sort of trickles down, down, um, you know, I'm thinking of like the ways that um, I think many white folks that I know grew up in families where you might have a family member, and oftentimes it's a father. I don't want to like, but that that because of of their temperament, you tiptoe around, mm-hmm. like don't make dad mad, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and I feel like, you know, in my own family, um, my sister and I growing up were socialized to do that. And it, and, it, it, and it really, I've started to think of it as an adult. It did not have a lot to do with my, my dad's own emotional needs, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, just as all of us, he has his emotional challenges, but it was much more about that being so much the, 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 the sort of the default setting, right? I think it was my mom's default setting from her family, right? And then she just brought that and we brought it. But when I think about that, when I extract it from like our family dynamics and think about it on a societal level, that tiptoeing around, you do it at work. If you're boss, you know, you, know, you, you, you do it out in the world and I think that socialization um, and I also think that I, I, I feel like I've learned that black and brown body people also learn to do that because it is it is a safety issue right and there's that whole thing about like like white people get to not see and understand black and brown people and black and brown cultures and communities right? But the reverse is not true. As a black person, you are, you you become an expert in white people and white culture by the time you're, you know, halfway to adulthood because you have to, to survive. And so that, that, that 
that's a piece of it too, you know, and that <laughs> tiptoeing, you know, to of for safety, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that white women have been socialized to do a safety thing too, uh, which is and to be adjacent to that white male power, mm-hmm. and that that will somehow keep us safe, and of course, pfft, it doesn't, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, so. What you said makes me think about the work on intergenerational trauma. Mm. And why I love Resma Menachem's work is because he says white people are impacted by racism too. That it's a trauma for white people too. It's not, white bodied people are not escaping it. Mm -hmm. It just looks different. And what you said about the tiptoeing in white family, white space, that kind of thing, makes me think. Intergenerational trauma. European people come from a history of violence, of um, subjugation in different ways, mm-hmm. right? Of dominance mm-hmm. in diff- a hierarchical model that is very violent, mm-hmm. and it has a lot of that in it. That yep. from from what I understand, right? <laughs> and <laughs> you, it makes me think that black-bodied and other bodies of culture also have a similar tiptoeing for different reasons, right? You know, when you think about uh, Joyce uh, DeGru, yes. I think her name is Joyce yes. DeGru, right? Joy. Joy, sorry. Dr. Joy. Joy. Dr. Yes. Joy, there you go. Yeah. For some reason, I'm adding a C and an E. Sorry, Dr. <laughs> Joy. But when you think of Dr. Joy DeGru's work, the post-traumatic slave syndrome. syndrome, and she talks about, like, for example, black families not, like, lifting up their kids, not saying, oh, he's amazing. It's mm-hmm. because if you did that at one point, they would be sold away. They'd be taken away. So you want to diminish. You want to pull down. But it's like so many of the remnants of the enslaved period live on. Yeah. And so the violence, even like corporal punishment, like things like that in black families, bodies of culture. It's, it's I think, the intergenerational trauma. So thank you for raising that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I thank you for raising that. Did you want to say something about comfort? I know you were looking... When Annie was talking, like there was well, additional it, thoughts. It made me start thinking about um, that idea of like the white mythic norm and the like white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, like the norms of that cultural group that really shaped, came from Europe and shaped white identity in this country. And um, I feel like I should look this up because I'm not 100% sure, but I feel like a piece of that is like the peace, the quiet, like you don't, You don't say anything. Mm -hmm. You don't complain if someone has hurt your feelings. You don't let them know. Stiff upper lip. Like all this kind of um, Mm non-confrontational sort of orientation towards social life, towards interacting. Um, Really buttoned up and, you know. Mm -hmm. um, And it just got me thinking about like even how different groups, like cultural groups interact and... Um, thinking about like I have heritage from Italy and you know sort of like not in my particular case but like a loud Italian family and people are talking over each other and it's this whole thing and then I have heritage from England and (laughs) Germany and like the more dominant sort of like um, vibe in my house was like we're quiet we were kids we did not we did, you know, like if I wanted to ask my dad a question and he was working in his study, I would go and stand next to his desk and wait for him to acknowledge me before mm-hmm. I spoke. Like we, we had a kind of a strict house, but you know, quiet, all those things. So I don't know if like that's a piece of that, like thinking about like what have we inherited that we don't even know we're carrying, mm-hmm. you know, and that idea of, um, The like the urge for comfort, we all, all of us across every background have, you know, a desire for peace and freedom and comfort, but that like white comfort or the comfort of whiteness, I don't know what to call it. I think it's also one of those things that we, you also aren't aware of it. You, I, we are not aware of it Mm -hmm. versus your sense of like, every time I come into this office, I am uncomfortable. I'm right. watching, I'm paying attention, I'm making sure I'm, you know, mm-hmm. and safe. Um, yeah. 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 Well, I will say that I have European ancestry. It's sometimes hard. People who know me, who know me a long time, kind of get a kick out of this. So then I go, okay, 
there are some European folks up in here, you know, because I prided myself throughout my entire life being black, black, black. That's it. I don't even want to know about the other side. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming a more whole person of understanding, like, you know, this is what reality is. You know, they're, they're, those ancestors are in there. Mm-hmm. And that buttoned up thing that I mean, I'm growing up in a country that used to be a very colonial like uh, Jamaica was a colony of Britain. Right. Mm-hmm. And like seeing the way colonial uh, regimes work like the oppression in the United States where it's like you're occupied as as black people, right? And you 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 stay in your place. But that buttoned up thing is really a, it's an interesting European legacy for me. Like I even see now sometimes when we're trying to deal with grief the mm-hmm. stiff upper upper lip mm-hmm, the yeah. you know kind of like hold it together the you know, you have to like stay in a uniform. The tone policing that mm-hmm. happens, right? So it's like across, I see it in so many places where it's like, oh, you can't speak to me that way. But if I'm really not in the mood, I think I should get to tell you I'm not in the mood, even if I'm at work. Yeah. You know, so there's all these ways that it just lips. So I appreciate yeah. you bringing that up. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this before I move into my next? Uh, back to the script. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Well, I just wanted to touch on and highlight what you were saying to Molly about the violence that is, um, and the trauma from the violence that permeates um, white culture, white supremacist culture. And I, th- I, I, I've been really thinking about that a lot lately because you think about kids and um, when, when kids are, are raised in a culture that is inherently violent, it, at some point, it 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 cha- changes us, and I, I also think that we inherit, um, just even in, with our DNA. So mm. so being white bodied means that we we have an ancestry and a DNA that um, unfortunately is carries with it a lot of violence that has been done in the name of whiteness and white supremacy. So I think we all have that, and um, and that healing work really needs needs to 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 be done um to be begun you know and and i feel like it's um that is a is a very like that's a very um volatile topic i think is what is repair and healing that white folks need to do the healing they need we need to do in ourselves and the repair and and that we need to do in 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 our culture and in our world and so like I just think about like kids like it's at a certain point you just start to absorb that violence and then what do you do you know with violence and unhealed trauma you dissociate you Mm. know and so the disassociation that is necessary to be white in Mm. in this world Mm. where so much so many atrocities have been done and continue to be done in the name of whiteness. You got some gems there. Because it just hit me that there, we might have a lot more white body people dissociated yeah. from the reality yeah. of what this is. Yeah. That their fellow human beings are being murdered. Yeah. Are being incarcerated. Yeah. Right? And like we're dropping bombs all over the world on children and people and we're just looking the other way. Yeah. And I mean, white body people are at the center of that. Yes. As far as I'm concerned. Yes. Meaning like normalizing that. Because it was normalized during enslavement. It was yeah. normalized when we, and when I say we, I mean the culture, the society, you know, stripped Native American land, yeah. sent them to boarding schools, mm-hmm. put them on reservation. Like that's mm-hmm. a thing whiteness has done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. I think we watched a clip together of Adrian Marie Brown just capturing it really well. I'm gonna see yes. if I can like fold it a little bit of it in yes. because it's like we the society has done all that, never reckoned with it. Right. I think dissociates. Yes. So yeah. I'm like, oof. There there's two, two <laughs> like, different oof. like moments that where it hit me physically. Like the the power of that dissociation. One is our, you know, our our friend Valerie Joy who um, Joy. Yeah, shout out. Yeah. Um, so you know, s- s- have learned so much 
um, with and from her. And I remember her um, speaking of a trip to Ghana and um, being at the point of no return Mm -hmm. and realizing that there was a church over, you know, Mm -hmm. um, the place that um, captured Africans were held before beginning the Middle Passage. And I think, okay, if you're up there in those pews, what kind of disassociation do you have to have to call yourself a Christian? Mm That's what my film's about. The film I'm yeah, working on. Plug for my exactly. film. Exactly. <laughs> because that's exactly it. How can we as How can if you we're sit spiritual there, people, faith based people, literally watch that happen? on top of like that is some deep wow. dissociation. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. when I think of that, my whole body, like mm-hmm. I have a physical reaction to that, you know? Mm-hmm. And the other the other moment that it really hit me in terms of kids is watching um the film always in season Mm, jackie olive jackie olive exactly Mm -hmm. and there's a moment in that film um where uh there's a woman a white body woman who is part of a group that does um reenactments of lynchings and it's very powerful and that is some healing work right there i think um because it's black folks and white folks in in states where lynchings occurred, reenacting them as a path towards awareness and oh. reparations. It's reparative yeah. work. Um, and this white woman is talking about her family. And I, I forget if it's a grandfather or a father. I can't remember the lineage. I need to watch the film again. But she talks about maybe a, her father being... Growing up in, in during Jim Crow and being brought to witness lynchings as a as a small child. And 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 there was a moment watching that film, that that piece where I I thought because I, I have always you know, when I think about the white people who used to go to to watch lynching, because I'm just like I'm I'm so filled with anger that it's hard for me to remember their humanity, right? Because I'm so angry about that and it's so inhumane. But then I thought about a kid. He didn't ask to be brought. Mm -mm. You know, Mm -mm. when you're five Mm -mm. and then you're watching, like... Horrible violence. Like, and and obviously... Are we going to act like that doesn't have an impact? Right, exactly. And and, and I do want to acknowledge that that is a fraction of the trauma that black people are enduring in that moment. But it's It's very important important because it's like that is some unhealed trauma. And I think there is a particular flavor of trauma when you know that you are part of the enactors of that violence. Yeah. Because you are both terrified and... If you have any humanity and consciousness, you're also deeply ashamed. Mm-hmm. And that but it also could happen to you because that violence is violence, right? So you're yeah. at the same point filled with shame and, and, and guilt and terror. Yeah. And that's pretty messed up. And I don't know about y'all, but I have seen some of these pictures. There's a classic picture of a lynching where there's like a group of people around, children, mm-hmm. all genders, you know, like no one was spared, apparently. And you see them just kind of like looking into the camera. And I think to myself, where are they now? Because mm-hmm. some of them were like this. Right. Where are they now? What are they thinking now? How are they showing up now? Right. I'm curious about that. Right. I look at the school desegregation. I was pictures. just thinking about that. Yeah. Those white All people. the vitriol yep. Yep. coming to those little children. Yep. Right? We talk about Ruby Bridges and there's Claudine. Mm-hmm. They're so they're like names and names of black bodied youth who were forced into hostile spaces. And you see the hostility around them in these mm-hmm. images. Where are those people now? Exactly. Who are they? What are they up to? What's and the thing that I think is, is we constantly ask black body people, but let's just go across the margins, you know, so let's trans people, um, queer people, disabled people, poor people. We're constantly asking them to fit into the white, into whiteness and to accept 
being forced into hostile spaces. Mm -hmm. To accept being in a place where you're not really wanted. Nobody really liked those schools. Mm -hmm. We're constantly said this is the norm. And, you know, I want to remind us that black body people and other people create community without white people. Right. There was, that was when, like I, you know, my stepfather's from the South. He talks about growing up in segregated schools, but teachers loving the kids right. in those schools. Right, right. So you could learn and right. feel like you could thrive. There's a right. different dynamic. And we keep, I think, thrusting our, we have to be into this whiteness. And I'm kind of over that, honestly. I, my mantra is I don't go anywhere I'm not valued. I don't go anywhere where I can't be respected. I'm not for it. And I, I, I feel like that's an important part of this conversation. Anyway, we're going on we, we're having a good old conversation. Is there anything else that you want to add to this piece before I ask? I'll ask like two final questions on this. For I'm having another thought. Mm -hmm. Back to the postcard, the pictures of the lynchings, which actually were then also put onto postcards and mm -hmm. sold. Yeah. Um, it's also a message to white people, to those kids, that you stay in line yes. with this white supremacist program. Yes. 100%. Because there's no, like, if you stand against it, you'll, you're next. It is. Yeah. yeah and we're going to talk about that in a threat. future episode, yeah. that yeah. group, the, the way people are groomed. Yeah. Yes. To uphold whiteness. Yeah. Yeah. That's powerful. It is. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, we are kind of in this question already a little bit but like you know first of all I want to say that you know every time I hear people talking about not teaching a full history of this country it is so frustrating to me because I was raised here I, I came here when I was in the fourth grade and I've been here through through that time um, into adulthood when I did you know move back to Jamaica for a bit but you know, ultimately, I've been in public schools here. I've been in private schools here. I've done university here. And I'm going to tell you, we don't do a good job of teaching history. Hmm. I've worked, and before these folks started raising all the alarms about right. teaching history, it already right? wasn't good. <laughs> and I've worked in high school settings where yeah. students have said, we're not getting the full picture here, right? right? So what I'm saying is, cover to cover, this country has not done a good job of actually teaching the history, oh, yeah. right? Now it's even becoming more problematic because mm -hmm. they want to shut down things that actually happened mm -hmm. that may have made the history books. Right. But one thing that I take don't, out the one paragraph. Right. Take out the <laughs> right. They were enslaved. Period. Yeah. History. Right. Yeah. Whatever. So Malcolm X. Oh no. Sorry. Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream. No one talks about Malcolm X in history. No. So yeah. anyway, let me just get back to this. But I recall never learning about the Reconstruction era in history class. I recall only hearing this happened, you know, this very short blurb about enslavement, and then maybe a minor couple things about Jim Crow, and then the civil rights movement was a much more focal, and like the peace and love and, you know, the nonviolence of the civil rights movement. I can recall being in a class where we started talking about the Black Panthers and white students saying how violent they were. Mm. And so that conversation got shut down pretty easy. You know, so there's always been this lens toward whiteness in history, unfortunately. Now, when I really dug into the Reconstruction era, and I still could learn more about it, but when I really started to understand what it was, that enslavement had ended, and there was this program put in place called Reconstruction. And what Reconstruction was really, to me, was like an equity program. It was like, we enslaved you for how many generations? We would like to ensure you have some equal footing. So things like land being given to um, the descendants of the enslaved or the formerly enslaved, the Freedmen's Bureau, mm -hmm. um, work being done to kind of level the playing field, if you will, having uh, black body people be elected into high offices. I think we had senators. It was like a moment. And if I'm correct, it lasted about a decade. Mm -hmm. Like, if I'm correct. Which, you know, sometimes I have to fact check myself. <laughs> but I think it was like about a decade. And then what we see, what I believe we're seeing right now, 
is what we saw then backlash. was this moment right of backlash that yeah. we start to talk about yeah. where white folks in particular were uncomfortable with the idea that black people could be seen as fully human could be afforded the same things that they were afforded and so I believe 2020 to 2024 kind of has that same lens where white folks are like, wait, hold on a second. What? Well, we're going to actually talk about it. We're actually going <laughs> to grapple with this. Oh, no, we can't do that. So let's just cut it off right now. And let's just like put the hammer down. That's my personal belief as a witness of watching what's happening. But when you think about reconstruction and the way that we slid into Jim Crow as a society after that mm -hmm. and like had so many other things happen. I'm like, can't we learn from this history? I mean, and I personally, just to add this little piece, when President Obama was elected, I think that was the catalyst, actually, yes. for this backlash. Yes. I think, his what's his name, who I'm not calling his name, and his whole birther thing, and his whole, like, mm -hmm. you know, his whole racist, white supremacist narrative is is given momentum from this backlash, the same idea that how dare this uppity Negro... Yep come and be president. But like the two things together, if you know about the history of Reconstruction, the lynchings came out of that. Yep. Right? After Reconstruction, mm -hmm. it was pulling people down a peg because they were getting to be too human. Yeah. What do we think about that? What do we think about the fact that A, it's not really taught, so people don't even know generally right. Right. that yeah. there's, there was this era and that black people aren't just shiftless and lazy that they advanced and they did huge advances yeah. that were all stripped away intentionally yeah. and violently. Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? And if, especially as you compare it to right now. I, I, uh, I think that that is an incredible connection, a line of, of, of a through line, right? Throughout our history, but that particular moment. And what occurred to me while you were um, talking about re reconstruction, and I realized like I have a lot of learning that I want to do as well about that time period. But from, from the sort of little bit that I have learned and read is those, those gains that were briefly made were all fought for by black people and some, I think, white abolitionist allies. But that was the work of black abolitionists, you know, um, at, at, at great, you know, effort and peril, you know? Um, and so, um, you know, convincing the federal government to enforce, you know, and it was, and it was, when you even think about it, it's like 40 acres and a mule, that is, that is not reparative. <laughs> or equitable reparations, right? It's a start. Mm -hmm. um, but just that alone, and just the fact that, that, that in, in counties and regions and states where there was a black majority, suddenly you could get black people starting to be elected, like you said, you know, everything from, from within the counties to the state, you know, to the federal mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. um, and that changes everything, right? And so just that immediately um, was so threatening that it had to be, you know, very powerfully squelched. And, mm. and, and then you have Jim Crow and, you know, so, and, and you think about um, the structures of like apartheid, you know, um, and, and what the, the, the violence with which that has to be maintained. And so, yeah, I think that, that you know, if we don't, systematically challenge and dismantle those those structures and those forces and that impulse it that it will continue and i think we really see it rising up whenever there's been you know some some empowerment and some progress and you know um and i i mean i, I immediately went to 2016 you know and i think that everything that we're seeing since that, um, there was, I think, a profound fear. Because I think that at the, at the, at the heart of white supremacy um, and race, racist 
hatred is fear. And I think what you have it in Reconstruction and then you have it continuing is the fear of white folks knowing the violence that white people per perpetuated, perpetrated? Perpetrated. Mm -hmm. um, on, on black folks and knowing and fearing the same. Right. I think there's always that fear of retribution. Yep. And the thing is, I think historically it's been proven that that's not a thing for 100%. us as, as indigenous first peoples 100%. of the world. Like, I think South Africa is such a great example of that, for yes. example, and Nelson Mandela. Yeah. Um, you know, hopefully everybody watching knows who Nelson Mandela is. <laughs> but, you know, the reality is, you know, I haven't been incarcerated for, what, 20-something years on yeah. Robben Island. Yeah. And having been a a freedom fighter before he was incarcerated, having like really gone to toe to toe, vi like violent resistance. He wasn't like, let's just only sing songs. He was mm -hmm. a part of the ANC's um, arm, which I forget the name of it, but they, mm -hmm. they resisted violently, yeah, yeah. Uh, intentionally, because you yeah. can't, people who are oppressing you, you can't just always go, can you not oppress me? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to like let people know we're going to resist. We're not going to go for this. So he did that. He he was also an intellectual. He was also a, a lawyer. I mean, he was many things. He wasn't. And I think sometimes we just narrow and he's this. He's only this. He's, you know. But he was so much more. Post Robin Island, though, he came out with this, like, level of forgiveness. Yeah. Level of, like, how do we see our interbeingness? And how do we move forward together? To the fact that some black folks there were like, what is going on with you? What right. is wrong? Right. But all in all, I think he proved the point that this is not about retribution. Right. This is about treating people as full people. Right. Yeah. And if you do that, you win. Like, and that's my issue with Palestine and Israel. If you want to occupy and put people behind gates and monitor people and create an apartheid system, you are creating the conditions of fear. Yep. But if you actually pull those down and sit across the table from people and say, hey, we want this land for whatever our reasons, you know, our history of terror and uh, the Holocaust, and we, we want a land to feel safe, and give an opportunity for Palestinian people to say, well, this is our land. This is my ancestors' land. We want to be here too. How do we do that together? I think it could happen. I'm not Palestinian, and I don't know if that's what Palestinian people all want because, again, we're not a monolith. They're not a monolith. There's people who have different ideas. But I read an author who talked about that yeah. in the book um, Light from Gaza. Oh, my God. Light from Gaza, I think, is the name of the book. I'll try to correct it if I said that wrong. But she, the person talked about the fact that this one state, two state solution thing, if, if people are, are brought into that conversation, they'll find the solution. Yes. Yeah. But, but it can't be take on the, the terms off my neck. only. Right. <laughs> you know? It can't be only on the terms of one yes. group of people. Yes. And I think that's the history that Nelson Mandela brought us. It's not about yes. retribution. But that's the the fear of what yeah, is. and I think that fear is 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 because we internalize that violence. You know, I mean, I think mm. that that is a case of you're fearing yourself. Mm. You are not <laughs> fearing. You know, I mean, yeah. Talk about dropping mics. Because <laughs> I mean, that's yeah, what it is. That's what it is, and I think when we get at the heart of that. Um, then the healing really has opportunity to begin, hmm. you know. I'm just, uh, again, I am no scholar of history, and I was public school, educated by <laughs> right. the public schools in the United States. Um, but, you know, thinking about that Reconstruction era and listening to you both, it occurs to me that, that um, the model... And again, historically, maybe I'm wrong. The model of like 40 acres and a mule, which was in no way reparative, but was something and people who were afforded that ran with it until mm -hmm. it was taken from them. 
um, was also really paternalistic in its way. Yeah. And um, there was no program for the white people who had owned slaves. Mm -hmm. And there was no, to my knowledge, there was no sort of like, let's, let's change our consciousness about mm -hmm. this. Like, it was fought for and won in like a violent and bloody and gruesome war. And uh, the folks who lost the war didn't, you know, didn't want to comply with the changes that were required by law mm -hmm. and didn't in many places for several years. <sighs> and okay. I'm just thinking about, yeah, I'm just, like, that just kind of struck me. Like, there was this whole, like, let's, let's provide these little resources for um, freed people, black people, to, like, build yourselves back up. We're generously giving this to you. And then that was kind of the end of it. And then somehow people were supposed to figure out I don't know, like what what changed? Right. And here we are, yeah. in 2024. Yeah. And what would it look like if white-bodied people had been, after that period, I don't know, educated, um, brought into some kind of truth and reconciliation right. process? That's, like, like right. how did y'all get like here? Like an yes. actual reparative, yes. mm -hmm. like human yes. to human. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes, if if post Civil War, yeah, and I I even feel like I've read, um, and again like, <laughs> mental homework assignment, yeah. um, but um, I feel like I have read that in parts of um, the Southern United States, um, where uh, folks had enslaved people, they asked, and I think in some cases received compensation. Yeah. No, so, no, no. Yeah. So, yeah, they did. So, like, mm -hmm. what the <laughs> actual Because you fuck. lost your property. Yeah, that right, was, exactly. There many instances in history, there's a time with a, a, a ship that carried enslaved people that the, the you know, the property, the, the what's the product that there was an issue and they got compensated. There's yeah. time and time yeah. again where, so, you know. Obviously, <laughs> like... There, Ooh, there were these bar. programs, yeah. but you know, in like, you know, like, um, but it was sort of like you were harmed too. Right, well, yeah, 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 exactly. You know, I mean, and, and yeah, there's, there's no actual mm. recognition, um, of, mm. yeah. So, you know, and I, and I, and I think that, uh, truth, you know, truth reparations and reconciliation. I think we need a reparative piece in there before we can get to reconciliation, mm -hmm. you know, um, um, yeah. is, is crucial for, for this country. Um, yeah. But it seems not to want to engage in that at all. The country, I, don't, mm -hmm. I haven't seen any leader take that up in any real way. I mean, there's so many people in the Senate mm -hmm. and the House of Representatives. You know, I think about Sheila Jackson Lee, who recently passed away. But others, there have been others. I uh, forget the name of the gentleman. Um, he also passed away, but he used to bring it. Elijah Cummings, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. He used to bring it yes. up time and time yes. again. No one wants to do it. Yeah. But that is where I think we need to start. We need 100%. to consider starting. And Real think, truth and reconciliation, reparations, mm -hmm. reparative, atonement. We need to start mm -hmm. thinking about it as a society. And I think that um, that is some of the most important work that white folks can do with other white people is to speak, you know, loudly um, ab about that need. And and I think from the from the point of like from the the level of of economic reparations, yes, but also the the level of healing from the trauma you know of of this violent legacy and like that 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 healing always starts with acknowledgement you know and and um yeah i mean i think the i think there are like i think there's movement so like i feel hopeful in the sense that like um i think in canada the prime minister officially apologized to First Nation peoples, yeah. mm -hmm. right? You had, the United States has not even gotten like close, but I mean, I feel like okay, another, you know, country 
that was founded on genocide and and <laughs> and mm-hmm. violent settler occupation has mm-hmm. done that. So that that there's a model there, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and then the fact that like in California at least we had a reparations yeah. commission. You know, mm-hmm. how long will it take us to act on the recommendations of that commission? Right. But you know, there's these there's these steps and then backlash, steps and then backlash. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I'll close this uh, segment by saying I, I was at the Othering and Belonging Conference mm. uh, that happened here in the Bay, I think it was in April 2024, and one of the people from that Reparations Commission, I believe his name is Jovan Beckles, he's, I believe, no, that I'm sorry, anyway, let's just say a member of the Reparations Commission, I may have gotten that name wrong, was at the conference and used the word wealth back you know that yeah this is what we need yeah for black folks yeah in this country and this state he was talking about this state specifically yes. but when i think about the land back movement yes. when i when i heard him say wealth back i thought that was so profound because everything and i i stand by this every single industry in this country was built by on the bodies of black people on the land of Native American indigenous yep. people, 100%. right? So everything we see mm-hmm. has a connection to the black body being enslaved and worked into the ground, right? Mm-hmm. And it was okay. And it was made okay by churches, faith-based institutions, governments, every freaking system. And even to this day, when you think about what they're doing to incarcerated people, yep. mm-hmm. we're still working the black and brown body, yep. mm-hmm. the indigenous body, for the cap for the capitalist mm-hmm. industries yep. we see, 100%. and there has to be something to do to reckon with that. Yeah. So I mean, we could go on and on. We probably need a reparations episode. As we close, do you want to share any of your favorite um, books, podcasts about anti racism, liberation, um, whiteness? Is there anything that you want? folks to know that you've really benefited from? I will say in terms of history and not knowing history, I recently uh, came across the Reveal podcast. It was a series called 40 Acres and a Lie Hmm. that I feel like I learned a lot, you know, and we've Mm -hmm. been talking a little bit about reconstruction and that today. And I also, when I think about liberation, I uh, think about All About Love by Bell Hooks. Just thinking about mm-hmm. how to, you know, ways to be in the world. How can we be in the world in a different way? Um, and those are kind of the first two things that popped into my mind. Mm. I don't know if you have others, I love that. Um, the new Jim Crow, mm. I think, uh, by Michelle Alexander, really helped mm-hmm. shape my thinking um, on these, on on that through line, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and how these structures um, and, and, and thought patterns um, shape us. And then, um, you know, The Body is Not an Apology by mm. Sonia Renee mm. Taylor really, I think, gets at the heart of both, you know, how that hierarchy works um, of, of bodies and and the values assigned and also of healing and 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 how you begin mm-hmm. to work with that mm-hmm. embodied trauma and then of mm-hmm. course um, uh, you know my grandmother's hands and oh, yeah, yeah I think you know so those mm-hmm. yeah I think so many mm-hmm. so many I was gonna say all Audre Lorde's work yes all Bell Hooks's work yes um, all James Baldwin's work yes. I feel like for me, I also love um, James Cone, mm-hmm. his work around black liberation theology, mm-hmm. Katie Geneva Cannon, um, her womanist work. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, I think um, Prentice Hemphill has a book right yes. now, What It Takes to Heal, that I'm reading. Mm-hmm. Yes. And they are profound in that relationship between oppression and racism and healing. And, you know, I just recommend that book to everyone from the, the part of your personal yeah but how does that connect to the we yes i've been thinking about we a lot more after reading that book so oh, I'm gonna do that. thank y'all